chapter 5 today, after Sutta Discovery, volume 20, page 45, Moliya Paguna Sutta. Yes, some of Sutta books. Okay, this is a, a new Sutta, S12.12. So you turn it higher. This Sutta is quite, not very long, but it's a uh, give us some very interesting idea about the nature of language, the nature of uh, our existence by way of food. It is a, a very broad concept of conception of food uh, presented by way of dependent arising. And also a bit of uh, grammar of spirituality. So a lot of interesting things combined together. Right? It's hardly like three pages, A4, but uh, a lot of things to think about. Now, the protagonist here, the, the main person who's involved talking with the Buddha, his name is Moliya Paguna. Paguna is, is a, quite a common name in, in the Buddha's time, so he is given a nickname Moliya. Uh, Moliya is, uh, what do you call this, a, a kind of a tuft in the, in the hair. Eh? Sometimes you see young boys, you know, they have this kind of tough on head, especially Chinese boys. So this person he keeps his hair long and he ties like a knot, like a top knot. So it's called Molia, but it's called this top knot, right? Paguna is his name. I think Paguna also is name for the months also. For example, like, you know, in English, there are people who are called August and women are called June and so on. I know someone called uh, January or so, as one, uh, one chauffeur, uh, my brother, my sister's husband. Yeah. So, a lot of people are named after moms. Yeah. So, he, he has this strange uh, misunderstanding of the teaching, so he keeps asking the wrong questions. So, let me just uh, we, we go through it a bit and then I will explain as we go along. Yeah. Page 48 is the the sutta begins, the discourse to Moliya Paguna. The Blessed One was residing at Sawati. So Sawati is a very popular place of the Buddha's teaching. It's a very big monastery and it's near this big uh, city called Sawati, so it's very easy for people to go there. A lot of people come and ask questions. So there is teaching going on every day, so to speak, as long as the Buddha is there. As far as the Buddha is concerned, there's no such thing as a holiday. Every day is a teaching day. So, in the manner of speaking, every day is a holy day if you meet the Buddha. Because the meaning of holiday originally was a holy day. You know, uh, lay people are very busy working many days a week, so they take one day off. So, the, uh, this idea of seven days a week is very ancient, spreading practically all over the world. South America, India, the West. So to take one day off, and that's supposed to be a holy day, and that's slowly evolved into a holy holiday. Right? So the, the Buddha addresses the monks. Right? Verse two, big shoes. There are these four kinds of food or nutriment for the maintenance of beings that have a reason and for the support of those seeking birth. So we need food. Food supports us, sustains us, and there are two kinds of beings here. One are those like us, already born, existing. And the second group, they are called those seeking birth. Now here again, you see this word, those seeking birth. Samba yeah? Wesi, you know, this is found in the Metta Sutta also. We send our loving kindness to all beings, Bhutava, Samba Wesi, Wa. Buddha means already become people like us. Samba we see those seeking birth. Apparently, it is a very, very important teaching in early Buddhism, but somehow forgotten by the majority of the traditional Buddhists. But the meditating Buddhists are aware of this, and those who study suttas they are aware of this. Yeah? So samba we see are what we might call the intermediate state beings, if you like. They, they, they are kind of a 
caught in between states because of their karma, their craving, so they, they have not moved on, so to speak. So they, they are disembodied beings, uh, just consciousness only, very uncertain kind of uh, state of being, if you like. And if they are not reborn soon enough, they, they lose their energy and then they're going to go into some suffering states. So we send out a loving kindness to all these beings. They, they can be anywhere. You know? So we just say, may, may all these beings be well and happy. And if we do this fervently enough, and these beings are around us, if they can sense it, you know, that they can feel good, and then they, they fall from that kind of negative state, so, so to speak. It's, it's a very simple principle. It's just like you, know, you meet people. You can be a stranger in the street, you know, and you see somebody sitting alone by the in the corner, nobody's talking to him or her, and then you just go there, you make friends with this person, and you tell this person what's worrying you, uh, and this person tells you something, or maybe this person doesn't tell you much, but you just tell this person, look, uh, whatever it is, you know, everything's impermanent, big things change, so just be at peace with your breath, some, some of the simple teachings, you know, and at the end of it, this person looks at you with very bright eyes and say, wow, you know, I feel good already. So you have, you have uplifted a being, something like that. Only thing, these beings, these uh, beings seeking birth, they are kind of, uh, they're already dead, their body is, is out of commission, out of service, and their consciousness is kind of wandering around, still not found a rebirth yet. But they're still sustained by food. In this case, mostly it's craving anyway. But here, the Buddha says there are four kinds of food. The Buddha is talking generally now. Huh? Met the first thing that sustains us is the food we eat. It's called material food. Kavalinkara ahara. Right? Gross or subtle. Gross, hard food. Yeah? The chewy, subtle food that, for example, you drink. And then the meaning is uh, gross, uh, the kind of food we take in this sense world. Then the subtle are those uh, joy, which the devas feed on. So this is the one. Joy is, in a sense, is directly mentioned here. Uh, I, I call it the fifth food. No? Because if you don't have joy, you find that you lose a lot of energy. So you have to study, you've got to be happy. No? So you have to be happy. Read happy things, do happy things, and you can study better. If you watch a sad movie or <laughs> everything is troubling, it's very hard to study also. So be happy is very important. No? So the first thing that sustains is, is material food. Number two, contact. Here, pasa, contact means sense impression. The working of the senses, what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, that fits us. That's food for the mind. Okay? So you can see here, it's a very comprehensive idea that Buddha is giving us. Eh? So we think there's only one kind of food. Eh? Your what? Roti pata, your roja, or your kwete, or whatever. Those are material food. Only material food. Then you have all these feeling of the senses. And number three, mental volition. Mano Sanchetana. Karma, if you like. Eh? Mental karma. So our mental karma also fits us. Right? Because if our karma ends, then that's it, you know, we, we, we our, our lifespan ends and we die. But this karma fits us. And then you have consciousness, vinyana. This consciousness is the basic activity of your senses. Now, this is very, very close to contact, eh? but contact is a kind of a, almost a physical thing, if you like. But consciousness is the mind acting upon the, what the five senses are experiencing. It's one way you can look at it. Okay? So contact can refer to the activity of the senses at the sense doors, whereas the consciousness is the mental response, responses to that activity. So we have three internal food, sort of self-generating food. The first is external, right? So that, that in mind. So the Buddha simply said, well, there's four kinds of food. These pictures are the four kinds of food or nutriment for the maintenance of beings that have a reason or for the support of those seeking birth. 
so there's a note there. The commentary says that the Blessed One stops the teaching at this point because he knows that there is an opinionated person uh, in the gathering and he wants to give him an opportunity to ask questions. So the Buddha is talking to a group of people, right? And then he, after saying this, he just keeps quiet for a while. He gives an opening so, so that people can ask questions. Eh? So that day, in other words, he, he is uh, sort of dedicating the teaching to Mulya Paguna, if you like. That's why the Sutta title is came up to him. So he's sitting in the audience. Verse 3. When this was spoken, the elder Mulya Paguna, so apparently this person, he's a monk, eh? said this to the Blessed One. Now, Bhante, who consumes the food that is consciousness? So apparently either he is very philosophical or he's not very bright. He says, who consumes? Ko aharati, ahareti. Ahara is food, ahareti is to take food. Ko ahareti, who eats this food that is consciousness? Or any other food in life. Yeah? And then the Buddha immediately replies, the question is not valid. Or the question is wrongly put. So the Blessed One. Now, this is a very important sentence to understand if you're a Buddhist. Eh? Questions which are wrongly put. Because if we ask the wrong questions, you get the wrong answers. Or you never get any answer. Right? You won't solve the problem. That is why sometimes uh, you find some religions try to trick us with these wrong questions. For example, if you are in a train or a bus, some, uh, a preacher may come to you and ask you, what do you think of my savior? And then you know, some of us don't like him, we start arguing. You know? That's what they want. So, oh, I, I don't like him. Oh, oh, I got my own savior and so on. And that starts off the conversation. That's the whole idea. This person knows all the possible scenarios you're going to answer and is going to challenge you until you get tired and then you join him. Of course, the best way is to be silent. Don't say anything. In fact, that's my favorite response. It saves a lot of time, you know. And they get very irritated <laughs> if you don't respond. That, that's one way. Because the question is wrongly put. Of course, if you have the time, you can tell this person, look, you're asking the wrong question. Maybe that's not the way to ask. You should ask, uh, what is the truth? Maybe that would be interesting to discuss. But I don't think this person is interested anyway, because some religions, your minds are already kind of fixed that way. That's it, you know, we, we, uh, I've come to you to comfort you, that's all. But in the Buddhist time, there's a lot of this exchange where people meet and, and they actually, you know, they're generally interested in discovering the truth. This was happening in Greece around the same time and also in India, where people were questioning very deep questions of life. So the Buddha says, Buddha tells Maria Paguna, the question is wrong. Notice what the Buddha explains. I do not say that one consumes. The Buddha didn't say A takes something. There is an agent doing it. If I had said one consumes, then it would be valid to ask Bhante who consumes. But I did not speak thus. Since I did not speak thus, if one should ask me, now Bhante, what is the, f what is the food that is consciousness for? This would be a valid question. What is it for? What does it lead to? What is it a condition for? And this again points to a very important idea in Buddhism, conditionality. Everything that exists in this universe are interrelated. One thing leads to another. All of us here, we somehow affect one, one another's life in some way. We might think not a big way, but you'd be surprised. If you really look back, especially in the future, you look back actually it's in a very big way. We could have done, we all could have done a lot of other things. But here we are, sitting, studying Buddhism, being very peaceful, right? That's good very simple. Or here you are listening to this video tape, having to this tape, and then 
being at peace with yourself. So the Buddha is saying, you got to ask the right question. What is this food that is consciousness for? And the answer to this valid question is, the food that is consciousness is a condition for the re-arising of future rebirth. So this consciousness leads to future rebirth. When that being is, the six, con six sense bases are. With the six sense bases as condition, there is contact. Contact means sense impressions. Senses work and uh, collect data from outside. For now, Bhante, who touches or feels the contact? Ko Pusati. So each time the Buddha comes up with a new idea, this person asks, who? Right? Sometimes we wonder you know, whether there is such a person who keeps asking such a silly question, in fact, despite the fact that Buddha has already strongly uh, wrongly put. You know? I think for most of us, the first time Buddha says that, after that we would, you know, maybe change all the questions. But here, for some interesting reason, Mulya uh, Paguna keeps on asking who, who throughout the, the, the whole sutta. Anyway, there are only uh, one, two, three, four, five, only five uh, statements he made. Of course, there's a possibility that uh, this person may have only said it once, and then the sutta compiler made it into a very interesting study text so that we when we look at it, we have a better idea of what's going on. Page 49. So the Buddha replies, the question is not valid. Or wrongly put, said the blessed one, I do not say that one touches. If I had said one touches, then it would be valid to ask, Bante, who touches? But I did not speak thus. Since I did not speak thus, if one should ask me, Bante, with what as condition is there contact? Notice, with what as condition is there contact? What is the condition for sense impression? This would be a valid question. And the answer to this valid question is, with the six sense bases as condition, there is contact, right? The six senses lead to sense impressions, sense stimuli. With contact as condition, there is feeling. So this is a kind of a dependent arising given in sets, very short, simple sets. And then Mulya Paguna asks, section five, Na Bhante, who feels ko vediyati? And then the Buddha says again, the question is not valid, wrongly put, so the blessed one, I do not say that one feels. If I had said one feels, then it would be valid to ask Bhante who feels. But I did not speak thus. Since I did not speak thus, if one should ask me, now Bhante, with what is condition is there feeling? What leads to feeling? This would be a valid question. And the answer to this valid question is, with contact as condition, there is feeling. In other words, when you have sense impression, feeling arises. With feeling as condition, there is craving. One more step in the dependent arising. And then again, Mulya Paguna asks, probably he asks in all earnestness, he's very curious, he says, wow, somebody is, okay, there's craving here. So who is the one? having craving. So he's probably quite excited about this. He's very new. So now Bhante, who craves? The question is not valid, wrongly put, said the blessed one. I do not say that one craves. If I had said that one craves, then it would be valid to speak Bhante, who craves? But I did not speak thus. Since I did not speak thus, he wants to ask me, now, Bhante, with what as condition is there craving? What is the condition for craving? What leads to craving? That's a valid question. 
And the answer to this valid question is, with feeling as condition, there is craving. Right? So we feel something nice we want. With craving as condition, there is clinging. Right? So here again, we have this uh, dependent arising in parts. Of course, now Bole Paguna asks the next question. Now Bante, who clings? Right? He is the who questioner. Right? The question is not valid. It's wrongly put, said the Blessed One. I do not say that one clings. If I said one clings, then it would be valid to ask Bante who clings. But I did not speak thus. Since I did not speak thus, if one should ask me, now Bante, with what is condition is that clinging? Then it would be a valid question. What leads to clinging? Now, we've got craving, clinging. This too is very easy to understand. Craving is you don't have it yet, so you think of it, you want it. Okay? You direct your mind towards it. And once you have it, something you desire, you cling to it. You don't want to let go. Okay? So one, you, you haven't have it yet, the other one, you haven't have it. Craving, clinging. Then the Buddha goes into the dependent arising. It continues. Eh? And the answer to this valid question is, with craving as condition, there is clinging. With clinging as condition, there is existence. With existence as condition, there is birth. With birth as condition, decay and death, sorrow, lamentation, physical pain, mental pain, and despair arise. Such is the arising of the whole mass of suffering. But Bhaguna, with the remainderless fading away, and cessation of the six spaces of contact, there is the cessation of contact. So when the senses end, in other words, we uh, don't allow the senses to arise, like meditation, then contact ends. With the cessation of contact, there, there is a cessation of feeling. With the cessation of feeling, there is the cessation of craving. Or if you like, you can simplify with that ending of craving, there is the ending of clinging. With the ending of clinging, there is the ending of existence. With the ending of existence, there is the ending of birth. With the ending of birth, there is, with the ending of birth, decay and death, sorrow, lamentation, physical pain, mental pain and despair end or cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Of course, to, to, if we are just studying this, we would think, oh, it's just a very nice formula, we haven't memorized this. But if you are studying psychology, or you're dealing with problems, I think that this flow of conditionality makes a lot of good sense. This is a problem-solving method. For example, someone worries about something, right? so you, you use this conditionality to explain to this person why this person should let go of this, uh, of this uh, worry, for example. In fact, when you talk to people when they're having problems, you find they're trying to explain the conditionality of it all. So this is the formula, if you like. Yeah? So this is the going right to the heart of what's going on. And that is why sometimes it's not so obvious at first. But you begin by looking at the formula, Try to understand the formula for what it is, on the word level at least, at least. And then as you apply this to your daily life, it makes more and more sense. Maybe you take parts of it and then you understand it in parts. You know? Just like the way the Buddha taught this to Molya Papuna. And then slowly as you apply it in your daily life, these ideas become clearer and clearer. We've got many lives to do this, by the way. So if you find this a difficult disciple, don't worry too much. On the other hand, you don't have to wait very long either. You can apply right away so that you're happy right now. Okay? So this is the teaching. We're not told what happened to Maudya, Maudya Paguna, whether he got enlightened or not, or whether he kept on asking questions. Or maybe the Buddha said, you better come and see me this, after this. We will sit down and chit chat in a very personal way, so we clarify all the doubts. But this teaching is for us. Right here today, 
so that we can look at it and understand what's going on. Now, I've written on the board some ideas which I thought about a few days ago, and then you are the first people I'm going to talk about this very interesting grammar of spirituality. Yeah? Imagine, when we were born, we, we, we couldn't speak. We couldn't understand some basic sounds. Right? And our mother's uh, vocabulary, vocabulary for the baby is not very, not very big anyway. Just simple sounds to make the baby happy. And as slowly as the child grows, the vocabulary increases. We learn language. Language is a very human thing. We learn words. Uh, words are a wonderful tool. But the problem is, we often take the tool for the reality. It, uh, you may not know how ridiculous it is when it comes to language. It's like taking the spoon for the soup. You think, wow, the spoon is delicious. You keep sucking the spoon. And how come no taste, you say? It's because that's not the soup. Huh? So in religion, people often talk about words, language. They frighten it with words like hell, sin, devil, and so on. Demons, God. You know? These are just words. The reality is, we want to be at peace with ourselves. There was a time when nobody knew all these terms. And there will come a time when people won't accept these terms. But does that mean they cannot be peaceful? They can. So the idea is, we have to understand the nature of language, we have to understand how our mind works, and how to get back to peace inside our lives. And this is what the meditation tradition teaches us. Now let's explore what words meant by this. Let's look at four words. Eh? These are four very important words, are question words. They're called the WH words. Who, what, why, how. Because how is not WH words included in the list. Uh, these are questions we ask to know things. Of course, there are other, some more WH words like which, when, and so on. We're not, we're not putting those things so that we can discuss our, what we have in mind within time limits. Yeah? This is just a new idea that comes to my mind for reflection. It's not final. I'm not saying this is perfect, exact truth. It's just a way of reflecting. Some people might use other words, but I think these forwards fit very nicely in our reflection of the four noble truths. The Buddha says, don't use who in this case. The Buddha tells Modern Paguna, you, you shouldn't ask who because it's, it's a wrong, uh, we would say wrong uh, pronoun. Why, why is it wrong? Now, if I meet you, I say, who are you? I ask, who are you? I, I, I do not know you. So if I ask, who are you, what do I want to know? I want to know your name. Usually it's your name, right? And your name is just a name. I mean, you know, if you go online, it's, you've got the most ridiculous names online. <laughs> you don't know who those people are, right? So it's, a name is just a sound, a word we identify people with and we, we, we connect with. Right? In fact, uh, how a person introduces himself tells a lot about this person. If someone comes to you and say, you don't need to know my name, you become a little unhappy with this person. Right? Obviously, this person doesn't trust you, or this person has got some shady plans in mind, doesn't want you to know him. So this kind of people are best avoided. On the other hand, someone may tell you the wrong name, that's worse. Right? Or someone may tell you other name than his real name. And also, later you find out, you say, oh, what, what's this guy up to? You know, it doesn't sound honest. So, and on the other hand, if someone is really open and, and wise, they come to and literally say, this is my name, up front. Of course, nowadays they overdo it, they have business cards. They put their names there, lots of titles. You know, they have to save the breath. And, I got one, there was one mug who gave his business card, the, the front part was full of words, and it probably take 15 minutes to read out those words. So here, yeah, this is my name, <laughs> and these are the titles I have. So, okay, that's going a bit too far. You just say, I am so and so, that's good enough. So that is the who. And after that, you have a sense of connection. 
right? You, you, you can refer to each other. That's about it, really. Because although we know a person by name, ironically, we still do not know who he really is or what he is. So just to know who, in other words, is to have an idea that identifies someone with something. Almost like a soul idea, like a self idea, atoma. So it's as if there is something unchanging doing this action, doing the, the craving, doing the eating, and so on. So Buddha said no such thing. This is just a, a condition that leads to another condition. So in that sense, who is not the right question. Who is just a name we use social convention. So if you use who, it's going to cause a lot of suffering. Because you, you think in terms of people as unchanging entities. They say, oh, this guy, I like that, I cannot change it, like to say, eh? isn't it? But we say, not okay, what, what, yeah, and so on. So that kind of idea. But there's no such thing. Maybe in our minds, before us, this person doesn't seem to change. My, my two sons like to tell me that I, I'm always saying the same thing. Every year I will say the same thing. I say, yeah, of course, but every year's New Year, I can't be saying something else. <laughs> so, uh, but it's, I, I, feel, I feel quite flattered when they say I'm saying the same thing. That means I have not veered from the truth. You know, that, and that's good to know. You know. So, but you say, who? You're talking like about something that doesn't seem to change. You know, something's wrong there. So if you, you have that kind of idea, it's going to lead you to suffering. So this is the first number two, isn't it? So do not, think, do not think in terms of who. Who is just a term we use conventionally to communicate with people in society. That's all. It's just a, a, a polite way of communicating. That's it. It's not a real person. Later, when you know this real person, you begin to know him much better. It's a different kind of who, all right? So you begin to ask, what? OK, here, what means what? After knowing who, I'm going to ask myself, what can you do for me? <laughs> what can you do for me, right? In other words, how useful are you to me? You know? So this idea of, uh, we're going a little deeper now. But again, this is quite worldly when you say, what can you do for me? You know, what is your worth to me? This is a business like assuring of people. But here, what if you really look more carefully, we're asking, what am I really? So that makes gives us very deep reason to investigate. What am I? The answer the five predicates. I am the five predicates. And from there you begin to understand better that we are all the time changing and so on. That's the meaning, you know. And underlying all this change, what is pushing us on is craving. It's craving. Craving that means we are being pulled towards something we think we do not have, something we want. So we are heading that way. So we crave for food, we crave for fame, we crave for pleasure, and so on. Okay? So that's the what. And this is the condition that keeps us going. Right? It keeps number one going, so to speak. So this is craving food. Yeah? And then we ask, you ask why? That's the magic question, very powerful question. I remember there was one story I saw, just a book I read, where this computer was amazing, could answer every question, whatever people ask. So that this programmer challenged anyone that could say that this computer can answer any question. So there was this very wise man, he just put in one question into the computer, and after that you see smoke coming out of the computer. The computer couldn't answer this question. In fact, it's a very simple question. The question is simply, why? W-H-Y, question mark, the computer couldn't answer that. It's a very question, but the computer was not programmed to answer that. But we can. We can at least think about why. Now notice, when you ask who, you expect a person as the answer, a name, an entity, which doesn't exist, only convention. When you ask what, 
in, in Buddhist psychology at least we're talking about the mechanism, the, the, the activity that goes on within us. What are we? Okay, the five educates. When we ask why, we're talking about conditionality. Why is there suffering? It's craving. Why is there craving? It's feeling like that. Is it? Why, 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 why? Right? So if you go on asking that kind of question, you go back, 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 you begin to go to the root of the cause of all this suffering. And when you reach the root of all this suffering, you get wisdom. You understand the whole thing. So you go back and forth, you reverse the process. And once you understand this, it's called wisdom. And if you go on building this wisdom, you uproot suffering, there is nirvana. So it makes sense, right? Why? Conditionality. And then finally, you are told how to do it. Eightfold path. The noble eightfold path, right? The noble eightfold path, you divide into three parts. You have sila, samadhi, panya. Sila, moral virtue, teaches you how to discipline your body and speech. If you discipline your body and speech, your moral virtue also is discipline. Right? First thing. How to train your mind, right? So, if you train your body and speech, then your mind is easier to train. You train your mind by letting go of negative states, build up happiness, and your mind becomes more peaceful. <clears throat> How do we build wisdom? You build up your moral virtue, which builds up this happy mental state. Together, the mind is calm and clear, you can see wisdom more clearly. You can see more clearly, wisdom becomes more clear to you. So that's training in wisdom. Sila Samadhi Okay? So that's the eightfold path. So this is these are the four famous pronouns, which is another way of looking at the form of the truth, reflecting at the form of, on the form of the truth. Any questions here? Yeah? If you're watching this video and I'm still alive, you can email me. I'll try to answer your question. If not, then run that. Oh, someone else can answer it. So, we're learning something about problem solving today. It's another way of looking at the, the, the suttas. There are many things you can learn on the sutta. Right? So, next time you have a bit of a difficulty, you have to ask yourself, how do we define this problem? How do we ask the right questions? And that's why in counseling, that's what we do. In counseling, the counselor helps you to ask the right questions. Right? So this, uh, asking the right questions is very important. Because if you don't, you might make the problem worse. For example, somebody is in trouble, Someone come along, superstitious person will say, oh, this is bad luck, you know, you probably didn't do this or didn't do that. That's definitely wrong questions. It's not even a question. Right? So asking the right question is very important in life. For example, let's say if you have graduated, you know, I know many students now are graduating. Uh, the basic question you have to ask once you graduate is, uh, will I get a job? Right? Will I get a job? <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the best question you should ask. Right? Maybe you should redefine it. Say, uh, how can I find the right job? Uh, that sounds a bit better. I'll play around with how you want to define the, the question. Okay? Or better still, how can I be happy? More basic. Yeah? So and then you reflect from there. Then from there, maybe you ask more questions. And then from there, you get your strategy for life. This is what Buddhism teaches, strategy for life, yeah? Some people tell you, oh, you know, you must have a purposeful life. They even write books about it. You know, the purposeful life, and they think, wow, it's a great book. Yeah, it can be a great book, of course, but remember, even such statements, they have a certain limit, you know? Purpose means your task is not finished yet. So you keep on, you need to go on doing it. 
isn't it wonderful if you have a purpose free life? Everything done, <laughs> finished, retired already, realize you can do what you like. So, this is where when we say no purpose in life, it is meaningful. No purpose in life in a good sense, meaning you can do what you like that can make you happy, make other people happy. Well, I can talk about my life that way. I can say, yes. You ask me what's my purpose in life, I can say, yeah, I want to translate suttas and so on, you know. But then, uh, on a higher level, I can tell you that I really have no purpose at all. If I go home, what I see I need to do next, I do it. And uh, when I come here, sometimes I, I want to say something, but when I sit here, I look at you, something else comes up to, from my heart, from my mind, and I tell it to you. And very often some of these things are even surprise me, they're so beautiful, so deep, you know. So if I had a purpose and I say, oh, I'll just come here and tell only this thing, exactly this thing, uh, then it's just like a school study, you know, right? So this is where purpose has a place, yes. But sometimes our life goes beyond purpose. Something more beautiful takes over. So we've got to allow that also. So these are different ways of looking at how our mind works and how we can respond to the world. Okay? Okay, any questions? It's kind of short so time. Okay, if not then we go to the next sutta. It's a quite a gruesome sutta in this one. Page 51. It's called the uh, Uttar Mansa Sutta. The discourse on the sun's flesh. I tell you, this is one of the most gruesome religious texts there ever is. Uh, remember, this is literature. So in, lit in literature, anything goes. So the Buddha is using a very powerful imagery here to teach us the nature of food that we should not abuse food. Someone died for us, something died for us that we may eat and live. Plants, animals. So in that sense, if we understand this, then whatever we eat, we, we, have, we, we eat very carefully, we eat uh, discreetly and so on. Okay. So this is a reflection. Putta means sun, mansa means flesh. Now in Malay, mangsa, the meaning has developed, become victim, eh? mangsa. This is the word, same word. Okay? As 12.63. And of course, we are still on the theme of food. So this is about food. Now let's look at the sutta itself. There are lots of introduction here, you can read for yourself. Page 61. That's our tea. Here again the Buddha is talking. Says, the Buddha says, we choose. There are these four kinds of food, nutriment, for the maintenance of beings that have arisen and for the support of those seeking birth. Exactly the same as the previous sutta, notice. And then what are the four? Material food, growth or subtle, contacts and stimuli is the second, mental volition is the third, and consciousness is the fourth. These big shoes are all kinds of food for the maintenance of beings that have a reason and for the support of those seeking birth. And then the Buddha changes the tip changes tack. And how big shoes should material food be seen? How should we regard food? This is especially true for the monks and the nuns who live on support from their people. But for us, it also helps to understand all this because it gives us a better idea of the nature of food. It's not just something we eat in front of us on the plate, but also internal, mental, karma, psychological. Now first, you have the simile of the only son's flesh. Suppose big shoes, a couple, husband and wife, had brought along limited provisions and were traveling on a road through the wilderness. They had with them their only son, dear and beloved. 
Then we choose the couple of husband and wife have been gone into the wilderness with only limited provisions, used up and exhausted them. But they have yet to cross the rest of the wilderness. So you go to this terrible desert, three of them, yeah, for some reason, maybe they're running away from some bandits, some war, maybe. Then we choose what occur to the couple, husband and wife does. Our only limited provision have been used up and exhausted. And we have yet to cross the rest of the wilderness. Now, if we kill our only son, dear beloved, and prepare dried meat and covered meat, thus eating our son's meat, we will cross over the rest of the wilderness. Let us not all perish. God, this is a really weird story. Eh? But remember, it's just a story. Then we choose the couple, husband and wife, having killed their only son, dear beloved, and did prepare dried meat and peppered meat, ate it. Thus, they would cross over the rest of the wilderness. And while they're eating the sun's flesh, they would beat their breasts and cry, Where are you, our only son? Where are you, our only son? Now, I know this story is terrible. But the question, why did the Buddha tell this story? Was he making fun of certain beliefs, of certain behavior? You notice, this, this couple, obviously, this parent, this son, uh, his father and son, they're not very, uh, father and Mother, not very wise. They have killed their son and they start moaning, say, Oh, my son, where are you? We have quite a number of stories like this, you know. And the story is where this, uh, this very rich man, Goldsmith, uh, and the son was sick one day, and he's a miser, you know, so he doesn't want to spend money. So he goes to all the mm -hmm. doctors and healers in town and asks them, Okay, but in this kind of sickness, what would you treat? What would you, medicine would you give? So he went all over the place getting information. So he, he went to get some kind of medicine on his own. And he gave his son. And the son died, mm -hmm. of course. And then, but because the son was uh, at peace with himself, he was reborn as a deva. So this foolish father started crying at a funeral and said, oh, my son, where are you? Won't you come back? Things like that. Very melodramatic. Now this son is a deva, so, so he, he comes down and visits the father and sees this foolish man crying over the dead son. So he, he got very upset. He says, first of all, my father didn't get he got the money, but he didn't see proper doctor, and, and I died. And now he's crying and, and wanting me back. So that's silly. Someone who's dead cannot come back. So he decided to teach his father a lesson. So he changes himself to a normal human being. And he went to one corner and started crying. Pretended to cry. The father sees him and says, This person looks very familiar. And he, he asked did this, uh, father, this father asked this young man, he says, Why are you crying? He says, Oh, you know, there are two circles, there are two wheels that I want, and I couldn't get this wheel, so that's why I'm crying. And, and this old man, he, he, he likes this, he begins to like this young man, but he looks like the sun. He says, Oh, tell me what you want, I, I'll get it for you. He says, these two wheels, I don't think you can, I don't know how you're going to get them. But the woman said, I'll get it for you no matter what. He says, okay, these two wheels that I want, they are in the sky. One is called the sun, and the other is called the moon. So I want them. I can't get them, so I'm crying. Then the father scolded this boy, said, you stupid young man, how can you ever get the moon and the sun? They're up there, and they're so far away. And then, this is when the boy turned, replied to the old man and says, Oh, so you think I'm foolish, no? What about you? Crying for your son who is dead, and you say, Oh, son, please come back. And suddenly the, the father realized, said, Oh dear, I'm caught my own foolishness, you know? And that's when the son told, told the father, says, I am, I was your son. You didn't bother to get the right medicine, so I did. And now you're doing all these foolish things. This is not the way to act. So he, it's very interesting that you have a posthumous teaching by the son to the father. So this is found in the Dabapada story. Right? So where you have people sometimes they have these very silly notions about life. So come back to this story here. So the husband and wife, they kill their own son and then they start saying, oh, our son, where's our son? Right? Anyway, that's not the real point of the story. Let's go on. Section 9. Now, what do you think, Bhikshu, says the Buddha? 
would they take that food for amusement or for intoxication or for adorning or for the sake of beautifying? So the Buddha said, imagine this food, if it is flesh of someone dear to you, you should take it in a fun way, eat a lawn and enjoy it like good food. Obviously not. Indeed, what the scenario here is that this couple, they're, they're trying to survive the desert, the wilderness. So we did not eat, they will die. There are no animals there, no food. So they just eat just enough to survive. That's the idea. Eh? So next page, the monks are said, no, indeed, one take. The Buddha continues, would they, bhikshus, take that food only for the sake of crossing over the rest of the wilderness? Yes, Bhante. Even so, bhikshus, I say that material food should be seen thus. So, in other words, the Buddha is telling the monks, respect food that way. Do not overeat. Do not eat too much. Because if you eat, the more you eat, the more killing will occur, for example. And then the Buddha continues, he says, uh, 11.2, Bhikshus, when material food is fully understood, lust for the five cause of sense pleasures is fully understood. So this is where we have to understand the nature of food. There are four kinds of food. Reflect on them. And we understand them, then you begin to understand how the five senses work. The senses also feed us. We all depend on food. So if we just take enough food, we'll be okay, we'll be healthy. You take too much, you will be sick. You take too little also, you'll be sick. Just enough, but not too much. When lust for the five cause of sense pleasure is fully understood, there is no fetter by which the noble disciple will be bound so that he will return to this world again. It becomes a non-return. So in other words, understand the nature of food. Now then, contact as food. And how big you should contact as food be seen? Here the simile of the skinless cow, the flayed cow. Suppose big shoes that the heightless or flayed cow, that means the skin has been removed, were to stand near a wall, creatures dwelling in the wall would bite or devour it. You know, sometimes the cow may get hurt, so the part of it is like, we say raw, and so an insects will bite it. If it were to stand near a tree, creatures dwelling in the tree would bite it. If it were to stand in, in the water, creatures dwelling in the water would bite it. If, if it were to stand in the open air, creatures dwelling in the air would bite it. Because wherever the cow stands to rest, creatures dwelling there would bite it. Even so, because I say that food as contact should be seen thus. Because when contact as food is fully understood, these three kinds of feeling are fully understood. So, what does this mean here? Feeling. As long as you do not understand feeling, feeling will get the better of us. Feeling will cause us suffering. Even pleasant feeling. Now we think, wow, pleasant feeling is good. We want to collect pleasant feeling. But that's not the way it works. Real joy works in impermanence. If you understand impermanence, then there is always joy. If, for example, uh, if you understand impermanence, something wonderful happens, you say, oh, this is wonderful. You know, remember, it's, yeah, this is a wonderful, happy moment. This is New Year. But then, as you know, we don't want a New Year to be the whole year. It's very really tiring, <laughs> right? So, uh, there'll be, what, two weeks of New Year fun. OK, that's good. I mean, the New Year celebration ends, you're back to work. You know? Suffering comes. Uh, like before I went for eye operation, I said, oh no, I've got to go through this hassle. If only I could use those time for my transaction work, you know. But I tell myself, I need to go. But before you know it, I tell myself, it will be all over. And here you are, I'm sitting here all over already. <laughs> right? So that's how you use impermanent, impermanence. Right? It is like yesterday, you know, we had two little babies, they were like little kittens, we could hold them in our palm, you know. Now they are taller than us. It's like overnight. Permanent, all these things. So if you reflect in permanence, you find things change. And if you accept it like that, you feel at peace and you feel joyful. Just take it like that. Accept change. So in other words, you, you, don't, um, you, you don't go ding-dong with the pleasure and pain. 
either way you are at peace. That's the meaning. So if you can do this, the Buddha says, when the three kinds of feeling are fully understood, there is nothing more that the noble disciple needs to do, I say. This actually, the Buddha is hinting at Arahatu. But of course, you need to go deeper to attain that state. But to understand the nature of the three kinds of feeling helps a lot to overcome suffering in this life. Next, mental volition as food. And how which you should mental volition as food be seen or be understood? Here you have a simile of the fiery coal pit that is big, uh, you know, on the ground there's this fiery coal, burning coal. Suppose which you, there were a coal pit deeper than a man's height, full of glowing coals, flameless and smokeless. Now there is a man desiring to live, not desiring to die, desiring happiness, loathing suffering. Then two strong men seize him by both his arms and drag him towards the fiery coal pit. Now the man's intention would be to be far away from it. His wish would be to be far away from it. His task would be to be far away from it. And he doesn't want to go near this really hot, blazing, uh, fiery pit. What is the reason for this? Because, because he knows thus, I will fall into this fiery pit, and on account of which I will die or feel deadly pain. Even so, Bhikshus, I say that food as mental volition should be seen thus. Ah, this is a reflection on karma, what we think, negative things that we think. We should reflect on those negative thoughts like this fiery pit. Let me be careful how I think negative thoughts. It's going to hurt me like this fiery pit. So this is where we are very careful about how we think. Then the Buddha says, if you can understand the nature of mental volition, how we think as food for our life, then the three kinds of craving will be understood. So in other words, your thinking is clear, then the craving will be uprooted, then you attain arahatu. When the three kinds of craving are understood, there is nothing more that a noble disciple needs to do, I say. That's arahatu already. And then, you, last one, consciousness as food. And how did you should consciousness as food be seen? Here you have the simile of the punished thief. Suppose big shoes, they, they were to catch a thief, a wrongdoer or criminal, and bring him to see the Raja, or the law, if you like, saying, Your Majesty, this is a thief, a wrongdoer. Inflict upon him whatever punishment you wish. The Raja, then says to them, go says, give this man a hundred strokes of the spear in the morning. So in the morning, they, sh they strike him with a hundred strokes of the spear. And at noon, the Raja says this, says thus, sirs, how is that man? He's still alive, your majesty. The Raja says to them, go says, give this man a hundred more strokes of the spear at noon. And then it goes on like that, in the evening. Again, he's still alive, he gets beaten up with a flat of the spear, another hundred feet. So he gets tortured at it, morning, noon, and night, so to speak. Right? Suffering, torture. Right? And then, uh, 23. What do you think, Big Shoes? Would that man, on account of being given 300 strokes of the spear, feel pain and displeasure? Bante. If we were given even one stroke of the spear, I can't tell you if you pain and displeasure, not to speak of 300 strokes of the spear. Then the Buddha says, even so, Bhikshus, I say that consciousness as food should be seen thus. When consciousness as food is fully understood, name and form is fully understood. When name and form is understood, there is no, nothing more that the noble disciple needs to do, I say. So this is a, a bit deeper understand the nature of consciousness. The, the nature of the eye is to see. There is just seeing. The nature of the ear is to hear. There is just hearing. We reflect on that. So you can reflect in that way. To put it very simply, suffering is minimized. This is Satipatthana. Right, yeah? So these are all very deep teachings put in a different way, of, a very dramatic way in this Sutta, Buddha Mansa Sutta. Looking at ourselves being fed by all kinds of food, understanding them, right? First is to understand the nature of solid food, eating just enough, eating to live, 
respecting food. Number two, understanding the nature of our senses, eye, ear, nose, tongue, and uh, body and mind. And then number three is uh, how we think, our mental action, mental karma. Be mindful there. And then finally, understand the nature of consciousness. Just reflecting whatever happens at the sense terms as what they are, nothing more, not, nothing less, so to speak. Okay? So the sutta ends there. All right, so we finished two suttas today. Yeah? Just nice. Yeah? Oh, the next sutta is a very beautiful one. Subha Teri Gata. Yeah? I can almost see the colors and the spaces and the trees like this Hindi movies. This is done in nature. Yeah? Very beautiful. Next one, we do this next week. Yeah? In fact, this is, I would say, this is the most beautiful of the uh, nuns' poems, Subhanteri. Yeah? We'll do this next week. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, so we'll end here then. Let us close with a short reflection. And today we have reflected on two very interesting suttas, the Molya Paguna Sutta. S212 and the Puta Mansa Sutta S12.53. This Sutta reminds us of the nature of food. So we exist on different kinds of food, mental and physical. The idea is to understand that we, we, do, we do not live to eat, but we eat to live so that wisdom grows in us. And when we understand the nature of food, we understand ourselves. We understand our own life, so the wisdom arises. Above all, we begin to understand that everything is conditioned in our life and therefore impermanent. So we have the capacity for change, especially positive change. And reflecting in this way, we create many good karma. But the power of such karma may our minds quickly focus in our meditation. May in this life itself we attain spiritual liberation in this stream way. At this moment of peace, let us send out our loving kindness to all those people who are important to us, to our friends, relatives, to our teachers and our students, and also to those who have difficulties with us and with whom we have difficulties, and to those whom the Dharma have not touched. May they come closer to the Dharma. May they all be well and happy. May all beings be well and happy. Sadhus, Sadhus.